brings out uh, what Eloy will tell us today because it's it's really important. And uh, over to you, Eloy. Thank you, Irina. Let me just share my my screen. Do you do you see my screen already? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, there, I, it's not uh, good news, as you, uh, most of you will know. Uh, last month, our friend and colleague Alberto Cabezas has passed away, and uh, we like to to spend uh, some minutes uh, before uh, we start this panel that is about uh, international collaboration, speaking about someone and uh, making a tribute to someone that uh, uh, really worked hard on, on that. Alberto has worked in the area of research administration for many years in Latin America. He worked in a uh, former National Commission for Scientific and Technology, Technological Research, CONICIT, since the 90s. And, uh, uh, but he also worked in the National University Network, REUNA, between 1992 uh, and 2001, where he was the director of the program, uh, information officer and the deputy executive director. Uh, most recently, he was the executive director, secretary for La Referencia, and he was really uh, instrumental and responsible for, for skillfully steering La Referencia into a full-fledged uh, uh, and sustainable organization and service. And once La Referencia was working and functioning well, Albert looked for opportunities to collaborate at the international uh, level and became part of our community in open air. I think most of us uh, have met Alberto for the first time at the kickoff of Open Air 2020 in 2015 in, in, in Athens. Uh, and although we encounter Alberto many times uh, 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 in the context of working, my, my fondest memories uh, of Alberto are not of, uh, of work, but of his outgoing, uh, warm, and, uh, and sometimes peculiar uh, personality. You always, and those that met him, you always knew when you were with Alberto. You could hear uh, his, uh, his laugh, and especially you could see your, uh, uh, the, his gestures uh, very wide and, and, and expressive. I spent personally uh, uh, many uh, days and evenings with Alberto, and I have particularly a very good memory of one of the first times that we, we met in his uh, country, in, uh, uh, in Valparaiso. He took us around Valparaiso and uh, get us to have a very uh, uh, delicious uh, congrio, caldillo de congrio, that is a, a fish soup, and then we visit Pablo's Neruda house, La, Sebast La Sebastiana. But uh, apparently he's very, he was very outgoing, but he was also very private, and so uh, did not talk a lot about his personal life. So many of you will not know that Alberto was born in Santiago, Chile, he, he, uh, he was son of uh, economist Hugo, an architect Hugo, sorry, and, uh, and an economist, the mother, Mabel. And Alberto uh, has uh, two children, Fernanda, who is a designer, and Diego, who is studying engineering, and uh, he uh, 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 loved and cherished uh, both. Alberto touched many in our community, and I'd like to, to read to you some of the many messages that we received at CORE when we announced that he had uh, passed away. Uh, from Kazu from Japan uh, received, I love his big mind and positive personalities. In my deep inside, I can still hear his special accent. All of them are my good memories. Thank you, Alberto. May your soul rest in peace. And from Michele, uh, another message. This is one of the, those news I had never wanted to receive. Thanks for sharing this and let the, uh, the community know. I'm really going to miss him. He was always able to make things lighter and his great and no, uh, uh, with his great and noisy love. He was a great colleague and a friend. Alberto, we will miss you and we will raise a glass in your memory the next time that we'll be able to get together in our community at, at, at COA. Descanse em paz, Alberto. Uh, te estranharemos. En, en realidad, ya te estranhamos. Thank, Thank you, Lloyd. Lloyd. And now we'll start with with the panel, and uh, we'll he hear perspectives from uh, different uh, regions and countries. So we'll start with um, Kathleen Scherer uh, from CORE, and then um, we'll have speakers from um, Greer, 
Bianca from uh, La Referencia, Pierre uh, from Carl from Canada, uh, Omo from uh, Africa and uh, Judith from Europe. And uh, I'll introduce them when it will be their turn to speak. Uh, and uh, now over to Kathleen, uh, who probably doesn't need an introduction because she leads uh, international alignment activities uh, in open air. And she's also core director. And, and thanks, Eloy, for, for giving us that tribute. I know that um, Alberto will stay alive in our hearts and in our memories. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my slides OK? Yes. Thanks. Um, thanks again, and, and um, it's great to be here to discuss um, international alignment. Um, CORE has been working on these activities since our inception in, in 2009, and with um, the financial support and funding through Open Air, we've been able to increase and expand the types of activities around international alignment. And so I'm going to present some of these activities to you today, or certainly our strategy for advancing these activities at CORE. So uh, very, very briefly, um, for those of you who don't know, CORE is an international association. We were launched in, in 2009 and, and our offices are based in Germany and Portugal. Um, at the moment, we have over 150 members and partners from, from five continents around the world. Um, and I think underpinning everything that we do really is to position repositories as a distributed globally networked infrastructure for open scholarship. So what we are really trying to do at CORE, our, our main objective is the adoption of open scholarship um, and expanding and enhancing the role of repositories in that environment so that we can build value added services on top of repositories and content. And we hope that this will transform the system making it more research centric, open to innovation, and also collectively managed by the scholarly community. Of course, um, we all know that, that research is global. Um, international research is critical. Um, we can see the map of, of Giant here, which shows the connections of all the high speed networks um, around the world to support um, education and research. And of course, these networks are there to allow researchers to collaborate from different regions and different countries. Um, and many of our challenges that we're facing at the moment really need to be addressed at this international level. Um, for example, climate change or um, top of mind now, uh, COVID-19 which you know, is a, an international problem and really needs to be addressed at the international level. And actually COVID-19 has really advanced or accelerated open science practices around the world in, in terms of rapid increase, um, rapid sharing of, of research outputs. Um, but it's also important to understand and be aware that research is also very local and um, there are a lot of research problems that are um, uh, localized and need to be addressed and, and should be addressed um, locally and, and maybe not of complete res relevance to other, other countries. So we need to be able to support those local research priorities that don't have international, that aren't so important internationally. We need to um, support um, the use and um, implementation and, uh, of, of different languages and workflows. We need to support and ensure that those um, organizations and countries that have less resources are able to participate in um, the scientific communication systems. So I think one of the things um, uh, that CORE has been promoting along with international alignment 
is an awareness um, uh, of the importance of diversity and a distributed system. So a diversity of services and platforms uh, adopted in a very distributed manner that supports these different research priorities, languages, publication outputs, and so on. And so the question we have at core is, is how, how we can balance these two elements. Um, how can we balance the local with the global? Um, and so um, the way that we have been trying to advance um, this is through encouraging um, and supporting the development of localized infrastructures such as repositories or repository networks that, um, that provide services for their local communities. Um, the adoption of community governance, I think, has grown in importance, and, and we are, we're gaining a better understanding of why community governance is so important um, in terms of guiding the services around infrastructure so they can actually support those local needs. And then nurturing um, communities of practices in different uh, countries and regions. And then on the, the global side, how do we make sure that those local um, services and infrastructures are not siloed. How can they, those services and infrastructures participate in an international scientific communication system? And we've been doing that through encouraging the harmonization of metadata, um, through um, um, thinking about how to share data across networks, which is important for um, uh, alignment, but it's also important for making sure that all data isn't contained in just one infrastructure so that there's, um, there are copies of, of data around, uh, uh, held around in different infrastructures and services so that if one infrastructure goes down, we still have that data available. Um, we're supporting co-designing of technologies and services across networks knowledge sharing and um, in particular uh, of particular importance for core is uh, common behaviors and functionalities of repositories so that we can build value added services on top of them. So I mentioned earlier that um, core has 150 or so members and partners which are um, university university libraries in some cases uh, governments funders um, not-for-profit organizations, but uh, our reach goes far beyond those 150 institutions because we're engaging with repository networks. So this just gives you um, an overview of the networks that we're currently um, uh, actively engaged with. Um, and these bridge across North America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, um, uh, Eastern Europe, and in the Asian context as well. And, and our strategy around alignment really um, is different depending on the level of development of the repository networks in, in each region or in each country. So um, where there are very few, where there um, as, as, is kind of the, the, the base level of development, we really are quite active in terms of capacity building and supporting the development of basic infrastructures. At the second level where there are countries that may have repositories, but those repositories aren't together through any type of, of network. So they're in a kind of institutional silos. We try to encourage and support the development of, of national networks. And then where um, there are regions or countries that already have very strong national or regional networks, we're trying to work at the level of data sharing across those, those networks. And then wrapped around all of this is the, uh, the promotion of best practices for repositories and repository networks and metadata harmonization. And so I think I'll leave it there. And I'm very interested and excited to hear my, my, my colleagues uh, representing different regions to give us more information about what they're doing and how they perceive um, um, the challenges around um, interoperability and alignment from their context. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kathleen. Uh, 
I don't see any burning questions. And if you don't mind, we'll take questions uh, after each panelist uh, speaks. Now I have a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sokwang Sung, who is uh, Director of Research Data Sharing Center, the Division of National Science and Technology Data at uh, Korea Institute of Science and Technology Information, or KISTI for short. And uh, we in open air are very happy to collaborate with KISTI. And uh, I think, Aslan, you have to stop sharing. I hope you can start sharing your screen. Kwon Song. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Sa Gwang Song, uh, who is in charge of Research Data Sharing Center in KISTI. KISTI is a, a Korea Institute of Science and Technology Information. To begin with, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce KISTI's open science activities in this honorable event. Uh, before uh, getting to uh, the point, I would like to briefly explain uh, the KISTI. Uh, actually, KISTI is the only research institute designated by Science and Technology Framework Act for establishing national science and technology infrastructure in Korea. The uh, research part of KISTI consists of three divisions, supercomputing division, Data Analysis Division and National Science and Technology Data Division, in which I belong. In. Okay. Uh, let's get to the topic. Uh, to this topic, uh, open science uh, had been uh, up, appeared as a major agenda in OECD Science Ministers' Meeting in 2015, Daejeon, Korea. Since then, uh, KISTI has been focusing on uh, three perspectives of open science, open access, open research data, and open collaboration. This is because uh, OECD report on open science in 2015 focused on those three main aspects. So from these three uh, perspectives, I will introduce KISTI's open science activities. Oops. At first, I'll talk about the Korean open, ac open access status. Unfortunately, uh, the Korean government's open access policy has not been established yet, but uh, there are three major organizations related to open science. They are KISTI, uh, National uh, Research Foundation and National Library of Korea. KISTI has conducted many projects and activities, including open access repository development, scope three uh, national contact point and open access Korea project from 2009 through 2013. Yeah. Uh, NRF has recently focused on research on OS policy, while uh, National Library of Korea has been working on uh, maintaining OpenX Korea project since 2014. Uh, additionally, KISTI launched National Open Access Repository, so-called CORE, it provides open access article research repository for self-archiving, collaborative co-authoring tool, and predatory general conference list. Uh, from the perspective of uh, open collaboration, uh, 
uh, KISTI established a data center for data intensive research named GSDC, an online simulation and education system, uh, so called Edison. They uh, promote online collaboration among researchers and students. Uh, due to uh, recent non face to face situations, those systems are increasingly popular nowadays. Sorry. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, one another thing is uh, we also have I know ACOMS, which is an online system was designed to enhance the efficiency and convenience of submission and review process in general publishing. Lastly, uh, let me get into the Korean open research data policy, as well as related KISTIS activities. This slide gives you the conceptual perspective on the government strategy titled Research Data Share and Utilization Strategy, established by the task force team led by the Secretary of Science and ICT in 2017. There are four kinds of key themes in this strategy. They are uh, legal system modification, human resource training, infrastructure building, and research community proliferation. Among the four, KISTI takes part in both supporting legal system modification and building infrastructure for research data share and utilization. As an amendment of legal system, government added a data management plan procedure to the regulation on the management of national R&D projects in September 2019, last year. Due to the re uh, regulation, uh, the data management plan has been applied to 309 pilot projects from two Korean funders since 2019. 298 projects in NRF and 11 from in IITP, Institute of Information and Communication Technology Planning and Evaluation. In addition, uh, 24 government funded research institutes will apply the DMP procedure to their internal projects by the end of uh, 2020. But uh, unfortunately, the DU Act, uh, National R&D Innovation Act, in which the DMP has been uh, unfortunately deleted, uh, will come to effect in January 2021. Uh, from now on, I'm going to talk about open research data platform, so-called Data On. Data On has been developed by reflecting the needs of Korean researchers since 2018 and opened public in January 2020 this year. Uh, this is the conceptual diagram of data on. You can see data on in the red, red dashed box and offers five main services, data preservation, convenience search, analysis environment, statistics, and online community. To sum up, uh, so KISTI has been uh, engaged in open science activities uh, from these three uh, perspectives, open access, open research data, and open collaboration. The only policy, policy related to open science in Korea is the DMP. So several underlying regulations are pop applying uh, and uh, the number of GMP projects uh, is increasing. However, uh, with the recent enactment of the new act, National R&D Innovation Act, the DMP system is expected to have limitations. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much. Uh, there was a question in the chat from our colleague Daniel from um, Vienna University about uh, national uh, open access, open science policies in uh, Korea, which I think you, you already covered. And uh, are you optimistic about the developments or you could you expect a national policy sometime soon or it's it's hard to tell actually it's hard to tell but uh we are uh consistently uh, so, uh persuading the the government officers to and then you know, parliaments to set up uh, a new uh regulation or act uh, for open access or open science but uh, for now, uh, uh, we need some time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And there is also a question from our colleague, Ellie Dyke from Dance in the Netherlands. How many open access publications can be found in the repository? And it's in the Q&A. So maybe you can, you can type an answer there. Okay. And um, I don't see any other questions. Um, Oh, well, thanks a lot. And uh, um, there's a, well, a, another question in the chat, Irina. Mm -hmm. from Pierre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a question. Uh, what type of limitations will apply to the DMP in this new policy uh, that you described? Uh, I mean, the limitation is, you know, the spread of the regulations uh, is based on uh, the regulations enacted uh, last year, but this year we have a new act, National R&D Innovation Act, which does not uh, include DMP proce procedure. So uh, we was uh, really happy when the uh, new act has been activated last year, because you know the Korean uh, researchers and institutes are trying to follow the DMP process. But uh, for now, uh, we have no, uh, we lose uh, you know, the, you know, the role, the, the regulations. So uh, I'm not sure whether you know, the other uh, government fund research institutes, including other you know, funders, are still uh, following the DMP process when they, you know, uh, manage the projects. So that's the limitation uh, when you apply the DMP. Okay, is it okay for the uh, answer for the question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I hope we'll thank continue you. discussion uh, in, uh, in the panel mode uh, shortly. And now it's another person who doesn't need an introduction. Uh, Bianca Amaro from Ibiza in Brazil and uh, La Referencia in Latin America. And uh, she was one of the very first person whom I met in the open access movement. And uh, over to you, Bianca. And thanks a lot for all your work and for open air. It's, it's a great pleasure to collaborate with La Referencia. Thank you, Verena. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and thank you for the invitation. Let me share my screen. Um, here. Uh, just a moment. It's okay, isn't it? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for, in the name of La Referencia, for this beautiful tribute uh, for the Alberto Cabezas. It's a great loss for us. And uh, I'll start presenting the latest development in open science policies and infrastructure in Latin America. Uh, well, what means La Referencia? It's a network of open access repositories for science. And our mission is to give visibility 
to the publicly funded science production in Latin America through the cooperation and articulation of a federated network of institutional and data repositories based on regional agreements for the national open strategies. Well, now uh, we have the participation of 10 countries of the region, and we are always looking for the growth of the network. Uh, we work uh, based in three pillars, agreements of public goods, interoperability, alliances and projects, guidelines, uh, mainly open air, LR, application profile, information quality, scientific data and guidelines in general, mainly international guidelines. And uh, one of the most important developments that we have uh, are related to the technology uh, in terms of harvesters, transfers, uh, pilots, development, and community. Open science policies in the region. Uh, we have nowadays in Latin America, 37 uh, OA institutional mandates and policies registered at Roar Map. Most of them are institutional, not a national policies. Uh, it's interesting because the, the institutions are uh, making uh, some kind of a move of uh, a national uh, policies. Uh, open science uh, countries legislations. Now we have Peru uh, and Mexico policies that uh, are related to the open access, not, not to the open science, but Argentina has a national policy that uh, treats uh, about open science. Chile is now in the public consultation about uh, their uh, national policies. In Brazil, we have a draft legislation on open access in open science. We have in the region uh, an asymmetry inside each country and amongst, amongst the uh, Latin American countries with some international collaborations and funding. Latin America does not have a common fund for R&D. It's very important to say we are not uh, like uh, Europe that has a, a, a open projects like open air. Uh, we don't have funds. We have to uh, work with our national funds. And uh, the funds come, comes mainly from each country and not always in a stable way, as you know. In general terms, data repositories are still incipient in the region. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, La Referencia has implemented and distributed infrastructure based on national nodes running the same software. La Referencia software allows the harvesting, enrichment, and sharing of metadata of literature and data. The regional infrastructure interoperates with other regionals, such open air, as you can see here, our, how works La Referencia. Uh, international, in terms of international alignment, La Referencia's countries are core members. It's very important to us to be a core members. And uh, we are part of Open Air 2020 and Open Air Advanced Projects, like Distributed Usage Statistics, Open Air Broker, Guidelines 3.0, uh, 3, uh, and 4.0. And we have two most very important to us. Uh, one of them is with Zenodo, it's a kind of collaboration. And the other one is with FCT, 
from Portugal that is the development of La Referencia software. Which are our challenges? Uh, first, uh, first is to change the way in which researchers are evaluated to include open access activities. Uh, convince national funding agencies to link funding with the adoption condition of open and open science to create a national legal framework on open science in all countries, changing the culture of research managers of institutions and researchers in favor of open science, obtain national, regional and international funding to support open science activities. Uh, we have challenges uh, uh, also with build a common infrastructure for large data storage and interoperability since Latin America does not have common found sources. Uh, we have them also uh, to create a stronger national infrastructure with a proper technical human resources. Uh, increase metadata quality and interoperability. Consolidate a collaborative software development network. And the asymmetry requires setting priorities and working at regional and international levels. Well, I think that it's a general view about the region. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bianca. It was very good. I don't see any questions uh, now. So maybe we can move on with, with our next speaker, who is um, Pierre Lussau from uh, CARL, Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Uh, and thanks a lot, Pierre, for joining us so early and apologies that it's really hard to host meetings in a reasonable time for everyone if you expect people joining from all over the world. Well, thanks, Irina. No problem. So let me That's share. Good. Yeah, Bian Bianca will stop I'm, sharing. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I can do it. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes, thank you. I just pass out the pre presentation mode. Mm -hmm. And Open Air is very happy to collaborate with Carl. So over to you, Pierre. Okay. So you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Well, well thanks, Irina. So my name is Pierre Lazou. I'm, um, I'm a scholarly communication librarian at uh, Université Laval in Quebec City. And I also working with Carl on the open air project, which I will talk about uh, in my presentation. So basically, uh, we, we are talking about open air and Canadian repositories and the uh, integrating Canadian repositories into global services. First of all, uh, what uh, a thing that inspired us uh, in participating in, in such initiative like open air advance. Uh, is a statement CoR made in uh, 2018, uh, which means position repositories as a foundation for a distributed globally network infrastructure for communi scholarly communication, on top of which layer of value added services will be deployed. So this kind of vision, that statement that Carl made, uh, CoR made, cannot be achieved without co coordination and cooperation among, among uh, institutions at the national level. And that's what we were trying to do uh, here. So the, a little bit of context about Canadian repositories. There's many uh, content repositories in Canada, scientific literature repositories, but also research data repositories. I would say nearly 80, 80 repositories, which are using a variety of software, mainly DSpace, but also Dataverse, ePrints, BPress Common, Islandora. There's um, very heterogeneous content development policies. The most common content you can find in Canadian repositories are uh, dissertations and thesis. 
but also um, one, one characteristics of our network is uh, we, we work in silos there, even if technology we use have open access protocols like API, like uh, OAIP image, uh, all our repositories work in silos in Canada. Basically, uh, if you remember Kathleen's presentation earlier, uh, we are at level two in the core uh, level. So we have value added uh, repositories in Canada. We have three, uh, mainly based on uh, uh, the type of content. We have uh, further the Federated Research Data Repository, which aggregate research data across uh, Dataverse instance in the country. We have also a program from Library and Archive Canada named Test Canada or Thesis Canada, which is harvesting uh, electronic thesis and dissertations. And there's also uh, Erudi, which is a platform for uh, Canadian journals uh, in humanities and social sciences, but which is also aggregating content from repositories across the country. So Can Canadian repositories are part of the uh, Open Air Advance project, uh, more precisely as the, the pilot, which, which is designed as the pilot, uh, uh, the aggregator as a service which means basically three things. Uh, connecting Canadian repositories to the uh, open air platform to make metadata and full text aggregations to enrich and enhance metadata based on automated inference, inference sorry, like uh, data mining on, on full text to, uh, to find information about founders and link publication to founders. But there's also a deliverable which, which will be um, a national portal for uh, for Canadian content. So how do we proceed uh, to, to, to participate in the Open Air Advance? There was a specific uh, group created by the Canadian Association of Research Library, CAL, the Open Repositories Working Group, which has a, a specific task, task group for, um, for Open Air participations. But there's also two other uh, groups that are wor still working now. The Mapping the Repository Landscape in Canada, which is working on identifying um, the various repositories across the country and try to find opportunities for cooperation and coordinations. And there's also the Community Building and Engagement Group, which, is, uh, which link the uh, Open Repository Working Group activities with the Canadian, uh, the Canadian community in scholarly communications. The foreseen benefits for Canada participation in, in open air was to support a greater visibility and tracking of open access content in Canada. Right now, it's, uh, it's very difficult to have an idea of, uh, at a national level on what, what, kind of, what open access content is available across the country. Also, these initiatives will leverage, add value and threaten the, the existing repository landscape in Canada, we hope. And we are also, uh, by participating at infrastructure like open air, reduce our institutional dependencies on external players that do not have values aligned with openness and the public interest. Those were uh, benefits for basically the library community and the, the repository managers across Canada. But there's also a, a very important component in the project which uh, aim at Canadian founders. So, the first benefits is to enable the three Canadian major founders in, to track open access articles more comprehensively and to improve researcher compliance with their open access policies. How do we proceed con concretely in Canada to, to, to make this happen? So the first thing we try to get is to obtain the major founder commitment to the project. Um, and. This, we work hard for many months at, at the start of it. We, we, ha we have a letter on a, an agreement on, for those three founders and they're looking at what we are doing. On, on a more technical aspect, what we, uh, we try to, to connect the, the repositories, we conducted a pilot project of, with three components. The first one was for DSpace, with the most widely used uh, software across Canada. So we decided to fund uh, for DSpace five and six, the, the code 
uh, for compliance in open air. Dispace 7 is working on compliance, but 5 and 6, which were the more used version across Canada, were, were not compliant with, uh, with the guidelines version 4. So it was financed as a pilot. We are now trying to implement this code and work with it. There's also uh, for, for institutions that were not using this space, we work with three of them. One was using ePrints and two other custom med systems. So the, the idea is to work on compliance and see, get, give some feedback on what, what's, what was challenging uh, when implementing those guidelines for other Canadian institutions that will try to be compliant later. And the third one is uh, we work with the aggregator further, which was um, which I presented as a value added services in Canada. So it's aggregating all research data across the country. So they, they were working to, to be compliant and to push research data to the open air guideline, to the open air platform, sorry. Uh, as this um, this year, we also work for, um, on, on, a, on a COVID project to accelerate harvesting of COVID content uh, to the open air platform. So this uh, makes us uh, build um, a, Canadian a, a Canadian aggregator for all repositories across Canada, which we call Canada Research, which is hosted by Mike Master University. So basically it's uh, getting uh, the most content they, uh, available across the country regarding the COVID-19 and pushing it to open air. So this is something that that happened quickly this year, and it make make us uh, articulate the strategy for participation of Canadian institution across two options. The first one is the one we were working from the start, which is uh, repository is adopting the open air guideline individually. And the second one was uh, the, the, the institution is participating to open air across using the, the Canada Research Aggregator. So those two strategies are push, push forward for the next, for, for the short term for participation in the platform. Uh, the challenge we faced, uh, first one was implementing the open air guidelines. It's way, it, it, it revealed itself more difficult than we thought uh, initially. Because one, the non, uh, there's, no, there's no software that was uh, compliant with the guidelines as a turnkey feature. So you need to develop things. And also, um, if you compare the, uh, the guidelines with other platforms like Base, Search Engine for Repositories, or even the program we used to have with uh, uh, Bibliothèque and Arch uh, Archive, Archive Canada, for electronic thesis, it's uh, more complicated. There, there are more more metadata. Uh, you need to to it's it's more complex model to participate with. The other challenge was to get the founders on board. We work out for several months to get to to get them following what we what we were doing, explaining what will be the portal for compliance monitoring. So it's a it's a constant effort in coordinating uh, activities. And especially it's, it's really difficult to coordinate activities among multiple stakeholders, like the Canadian Qualcomm community that needs to know what open air is, needs to be convinced that it's a, a good project to participate in. The three major Canadian founders that we were also uh, stakeholders. And of course, open air, which is an international organization that most of us, know more and more. So in, in those kind of initiatives, coordination efforts must remain constant. I will, I will end with a few questions regarding this uh, distributed and global network infrastructure. Uh, our idea is that we need to clearly define um, what are the role of the different layers that, that is participating to, to, the, to this infrastructure, the institutional layer, the national layer, if any, and the international one. And especially what, what we need to define is what we call an, a value added services, a value added services at the in institutional level, but also at the national level, if an aggregator, let's say in Canada was to be built and, and maintained in the long run. And also, we need to find entities that can, can assume, ensure the coordination, the cooperation between the layers on the long term. 
basically this is where, where we had. I must say that all this question of coordination, cooperation is in the library uh, area, something that we, we think we, we are doing well. That's true. We have, we have a lot of initiatives that works correctly. If I take two examples from Canada, we have for research data, the national layer for, um, for uh, the national aggregator for data sets further. But we have also more recently the ORCID, C, uh, the ORCID CA consortia that's, that is working for the uh, implementation of ORCID for uh, Canadian researchers across the country and which is now organized with a, a national um, institution that is supervising the implementation across uh, universities. So regarding a project like open air and content from repositories, those kind of model need to be uh, ref reflected, built, so that, so that what we're doing now as a working group can be sustained in the future. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Pierre. And your last slide was especially useful. Um, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I hope we can touch upon yeah. those open questions uh, in the discussion part as well. Thank you. Now I have a pleasure to invite uh, Omo Oya, who is a uh, Chief Strategy Officer at WACREN. And WACREN stands for Western Central African Research and Education Network. Uh, and uh, we've been collaborating with Omo on uh, African activities. Uh, and over to you, Omo, now. Thank you, Irina. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for having me. I'll just get my slides up. So I thought, you know, uh, listening to um, everyone, especially the last, oh, man, that's the end of it. Uh, especially the last slides, I would um, talk about the initiative uh, you know, I just mentioned, it's called Libsense. Uh, uh, to be honest, it's been birth in international alignment from the start. So it's a, the intent is to build a, a community for open science in the African regions. Uh, through library and REN collaboration. So I work for WACREN. WACREN is the Western Central African Research Network. Uh, Africa has three regional networks, one in Western Central Africa that I work in, one in uh, South and East Africa, and one in um, that is responsible for the Northern parts of Africa and so, some parts of the Middle East. So the three regional RENs are uh, been working in a Pan-African project for the last 11 or odd years uh, called Africa Connect. And uh, Africa can, the Africa Connect project has seen three iterations and we're now, uh, right now, implementing Africa Connect 3. So LibSense was birthed out of some understanding that came out in the second iteration that we needed closer ties between the library and the, and the NRENs that, we, that were our members because we had these projects, uh, some, a couple of them in collaboration with the European Commission, which was uh, intended to drive infrastructure deplo deployment and development in, in the regions. But we realized that you know, the information management capabilities of our librarians were not aligned with uh, the level of development that we needed. So in different forms, the community came together in this in Lipsense and uh, started to identify some reasons to work uh, to develop Africa in, in these areas to provide technical support through the NRENs, support the cultural change that was required for that level of scholarly communication, uh, build capacity and services. So like I said, we're both out of international alignment. We have uh, the top layer of that slide is the regional RENs, including GEN, the Pan-African, Pan-European network, that's all participating in Africa Connect 3. And we had other partners, these are the core partners. Um, so we had the University of Shelfie in the UK helping to sort of establish a research agenda. We had CORE and IFO. So Kathleen and Irina were there from the start trying to focus what we did around uh, open access uh, repositories and 
uh, as well as the uh, Japanese colleagues from the National Institute of Informatics and Opener. We had a, a very tiny task. That's exactly how I met uh, Kathleen, a tiny task in Open Air Advanced, where Open Air was looking at uh, an aggregator, the possibility of an aggregator for Africa. So today, through the um, regional research rec networks and their national networks that, 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 that are members, we sort of represent the uh, entire open science community in Africa. So I, I, I thought, you know, um, I would spend my time basically describing how we see this. So within LibSense, we work from the three working groups, which will sort of affect uh, most of our activities. There's one that looks at open science policies, governance, and leadership. Uh, there's another one that's uh, driven by the RENs and the librarians that looks at infrastructure uh, for publishing and repositories. And there's a capacity building, is a, is, there's a humongous need for capacity building. So there's another one that looks at communities of practice and training. And this is training across the board, you know, so training for uh, for the library uh, oriented colleagues, training for and training within uh, the IT aspects. So in terms of alignment, uh, I think, you know, uh, the best thing to do uh, for the colleagues on the call will be to discuss um, a statement that's been prepared by the LibSense Working Group on Open Science Policies and Governance that was uh, submitted as part of the UNESCO Global Consultation. So because it's sort of um, the ideas and the principles that we have about how we we develop our region and how we align with internationally as uh, enshrined in it. So, and the document, there's a link, I'll put a link to the website at the end and the, the documents out there, but I'll just discuss it in the next slides. This is the, the document has uh, two parts, two main parts. One part that expresses uh, the values and principles that are dear to us. And another part that discusses the actions that we're interested in taking to sort of, um, make this come to reality. So the, the key areas of those principles. So one, we want to address the uh, inequality uh, that exists, uh, support equity, diversity, and social justice uh, without sort of, you know, stressing it. We all know where Africa sits uh, in terms of global participation. And so that's some of those issues we want to address because we also think that, you know, it is not possible uh, to do this in its entirety without uh, owning uh, not just the ideas that we, we put forward, but the infrastructure that supports it. One of the principles would be is to have open infrastructure that is led by uh, the African community and operated by them. Africa is also a very diverse environment, you know, where there's um, uh, loads of indigenous and traditional knowledge that needs to be on earth. So that's another principle that we want to sort of put forward in the, that we had put forward in the, in the statement to UNESCO. So I, I just want to sort of stress, you know, the intent, you know, in with some of this without over laboring it. So for the, in, in, in terms of addressing inequality, we, we, we want to, be able to sort of get the community to define local, some of the earlier speakers had mentioned that local policies that are best suited for their own needs and environment that, that might be on a very granular institutional level, or it might be at the national level, or as you know, on the level I, I tend to work with, uh, work in on a regional level. But at each level, it's uh, contextual, it is um, best suited for the needs of the community that uh, that, in, that, it's, that it governs. This is more about the general idea and the idea of you know moving the focus to sustainable, a sustainable and um, scalable way to transform scholarly publishing in Africa. So we, the evidence is clear for us. We know that it is um, for this to be sustainable and long-term, 
it's got to be driven by the community. It cannot be, it cannot be commercial. Uh, it's got to be, it's, and it's got to provide equal opportunity for all kinds of researchers in Africa. We have, we don't, we, we have uh, a number of universities, not so many of them who have adequate resources to participate in the global landscape as a skewed today. But that what that does, it sort of deprives a huge number who don't have the same resources to engage at the, as it is described by um, other territories. <clears throat> For instance, you know, um, it's simply if we have to, if universities have to pay to publish, then those that don't have money do not participate. And we see African repositories, uh, open African repositories, repositories playing a very big role in this. I mentioned about, talked about the, the models. Again, even though they're open repositories, we're also seeing uh, increasingly um, offers by commercial entities presenting structures that are very attractive to uh, institutions that don't have any resources at all. So what Lipsense is doing is sort of advancing this idea by strengthening the community because it's um, for long-term sustenance of African scholarly publishing, we need to have models and infrastructures that we can control and drive. And that's the only way we can guarantee uh, a transition to open access that is that allows the global north and the global south exchange knowledge in a more equitable manner. Now these are the principles, you know. So I had mentioned about the infrastructures. That's the underlying. This is we hope that the regional research networks will provide uh, the backbone for that kind of infrastructure. We've had a number of activities with uh, like-minded organizations. Um, we the core. Well, some of the core principles are like you know the uh, we're looking at that as the horizon. We're taking the baby steps towards that, but it's uh, primarily we're looking at using open infrastructure as much as possible, uh, making sure that the commercial imperative does not cloud uh, the ultimate goal. Uh, we recognize that we would need all kinds of partners, some who might be uh, who might be commercial entities, but the governance of this infrastructure and the ownership would ultimately have to reside in the hands of the African community and governed by uh, a structure that is not for profit, uh, that allows the everybody to participate. One other, I'd mentioned the uh, diversity that we have in Africa, and that's on different levels. It's, uh, it's, it's on, on the language level, there are a number of broadly spoken languages in Africa, but there are so many other indigenous, indigenous languages and cultural artifacts that are that need to be curated, so that is a one of the driving principles in in our open science agenda. That I just mentioned. So in terms of action, so these are the principles that I you know. So that's this is on the website. I hope you would have time to look at it. And um, but in terms of in terms of the actions we are taking, so we have within the construct of the African Connect, Connect 3 project, certain sort of foundational activities. And with those, we want to drive partnerships across the continent and uh, with, uh, in other regions, partnerships with editors and publishers and libraries, all the major stakeholders. But the underlying sort of structure of these partnerships uh, is equity you know we see a number of partnerships that are, do not actually favor the african community today so the this lip sense is working with thankfully with partners who have same who have shared um, aspirations to redress that and through this through these measures open access to african research uh, the existing repositories already. We are building some more. We are looking at models that allow us bootstrap, uh, you know, research from 
within institutions that don't have the technical capacity. So, and all of this is towards um, developing sustainable, a sustainable model for African research and making it more visible uh, in, the, uh, in the global landscape. Same thing, and this is all the way actually. Um, so when I listen to, I just listen to the Canadian colleagues, uh, I've listened to the Korean colleagues, by the way, I'm speaking for Africa. So that's a tough, that's, that's a little bit more than um, speaking for a country uh, because of the extent, there are 55 countries in Africa. So you can imagine, uh, even I don't know exactly how, uh, how this exists in all, all the countries, but for most of the countries that I work with, we are seeing that uh, a reliance on external models that don't sort of favor African research. So when, you know, you know, talking about, you know, even aligning reward systems with uh, models that are European or American presumes that the researchers have the same sort of uh, access to infrastructure. So that disadvantages African research from, from the get-go. So some of, some of what work we're doing is working with the policymakers, the associations of uh, university vice chancellors to start to alert them to the need to sort of tailor uh, their evaluation practices, the reward systems that to, to, to support the researchers and open access and open science. And that's the way they, they sort of develop um, African research. So it's, so the career system that sort of looks at researchers now and requires uh, publication in, in, in high impact factor journals limits the availability of African research. Now, th typically the university management would be looking to match global standards, but this lip sense is deepening the understanding of the need to sort of look at alignment from a different perspective. Same multilingualism, diversity. Um, I thought I would end the slide with just sort of, you know, pointing at what these foundational elements, I, you know, I mentioned we were going to, we're using in Africa Connect 3 to sort of drive this agenda. We've had numerous meetings and webinars. It's all on the wiki, but within uh, the Africa Connect 3 project, which is a primary funder at this time, we have sort of developed, you know, we're developing community requirements from, uh, the, from different surveys. We have looked at the skills profiles that we need for uh, African librarians to perform their roles in this new and use this new dispensation. And we're going to be taking all of that in, you know, to stimulate the development of policy briefs and guidelines. And we're doing that with the African Union and the Association of African Universities. And the idea is to develop guidelines for open access repositories and journals like we described that meet those principles that uh, uh, we have outlined in the statement to UNESCO. As part of that, as part of also bootstrapping the, uh, the usage of uh, repositories and journal platforms in Africa, the Africa Connect 3 project is committed to establishing what we've called lighthouse demonstrators. This will be fully functional repository platforms and journal platforms that allow those that don't like universities and researchers in Africa that don't have uh, it resources within their immediate environment to have a catch-all. So if you thought about something, the sort of role that Zenodo is, is, um, is, is fulfilling uh, within the broader community, uh, this will be the, the same sort of uh, platform. And we have within Africa Connect3 as well, we're very, we have looked at the some of the projects that have, you know, that I think Open has also been involved in, ARC project with uh, federated identity and sort of seeing the, the need uh, to bring that forefront in our, in all the work we're doing with Libsense. Aside from that, it's 
human capacity development uh, right all the all through the way and um, and that is like you know a large part of what we do so i think i'll stop there um the link to the wiki is on the slide and i'm happy to take any questions thank you thanks a lot Omo. There is a question from Ben Cut about uh, trustworthiness, but maybe that's a question that we can take uh, to every panelist uh, after Judith's presentation. Uh, I will uh, turn off my camera because my network is not that super at the moment. Uh, maybe if, 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 you, if you don't mind a sec, uh, Judith, sir, because there is also a question from Cynthia to Omo. So maybe we can take that one. Um, so Olmo, it's uh, in a QA. and uh, a second question. It's important that universities that welcomed African students inform them about the development of the African infrastructures in order that they integrate them in their scholarly knowledges. Uh, thank you for all this information. Okay, that's, that's more like a comment. Thanks, Cynthia. Then over to you, Judith. And uh, Judith is our colleague uh, from... Um, Debrecen University and National Library in Hungary, and uh, she coordinates uh, open science activities uh, in her university, but also on the national level. And uh, uh, she is a member of uh, EOSC Skills and Training Working Group. Um, and your video is frozen, Judith. I hope you're still with us. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I will try to uh, share my presentation. Can you see it? Not yet. Hmm. Just, uh, yeah, maybe stop your video if your connection is. Yeah, I, I stop my I stop my video. Mm -hmm. That's the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, new slides are coming. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, just a quick overview of what we've been doing in Hungary. Uh, currently, there is no integrated open science uh, or fair data policy in Hungary. Uh, but we have like um, some uh, parts uh, that uh, mm, are building uh, the main uh, policy at the, the final end, I hope. Uh, well, uh, Hungary has uh, uh, undertaken the European 2020 strategy and um, we have a policy on depositing and opening of the PhD dissertations in Hungary. There are open access mandates uh, from the National Research Development and Innovation Office uh, funded research. Uh, there is a national uh, res uh, and there is a mandate on uh, DMPs from 2019 uh, from the same uh, funder. Actually, in Hungary, we have uh, the main funder is uh, National Research and Innovation Office. Uh, so we are working together with them uh, to have uh, to formulate some kind of an open science policy. Uh, open science. Uh, like uh, the policy and uh, the Ministry of uh, Innovation and Technology uh, is responsible for making uh, such a policy. Uh, and uh, at the moment, there are uh, higher education uh, institutional policies all uh, across the country. Uh, uh, there uh, with the uh, uh, the poli and these uh, policies encourage researchers to deposit, uh, all the research outputs at the institutional repositories. And there is a mandate to deposit all uh, their uh, bibliographic data into the main Hungarian bibliographic uh, repository. Uh, and uh, they are really, uh, they are welcome to deposit all uh, of their, uh, like the full text of their work and actually uh, data as well. <clears throat> From, uh, 2000 and, uh, il, uh, from 2014, there uh, is a mandate for uh, opening uh, of the PhD theses. 
And uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't want to repeat myself. Okay. Uh, the infrastructure uh, looks uh, like uh, in Hungary, we have uh, 42 repositories. Uh, these are all uh, institutional repositories mostly. These are all registered in open door. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, at uh, the moment, uh, um, there is a big need from uh, higher education institutions on institutional data repositories. So uh, they are establishing more and more higher education institutions are establishing institutional data repositories and they are establishing open journal uh, system platforms as well. <clears throat> These uh, platforms uh, at uh, like uh, data, uh, like uh, these, uh, some of these uh, Hungarian infrastructures are already uh, onboarded uh, to EOSC. Uh, the late, latestly onboarded re uh, repositories is one uh, open biomaps, and uh, there is a repository for publication. Open biomaps is a, a thematical service. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in Hungary, if uh, we are uh, talking about support and landscape uh, within uh, the open science and infrastructure context, um, the University of Debrecen, uh, University and National Library is the opener node since, uh, since 10 years. And uh, we have established a lot of uh, um, we have established a good relationship uh, with uh, the funders and policymakers uh, to aligning uh, with uh, uh, having a good open science policy. Uh, we have an EOS governance board member uh, and we have uh, members in uh, EOS uh, working groups from Hungary. Uh, to all, uh, we have uh, we delegated uh, uh, people there to have uh, like a wider view on uh, um, how we will be able to establish uh, uh, establish uh, Hungarian uh, open science policy and infrastructure policy within the framework of EOSC. <clears throat> We involved in uh, the national initiatives for open science in Europe. This is a 5B project uh, of, uh, uh, of um, <clears throat> EOSC. Uh, this, is, uh, this project uh, uh, helps to establish the national open science uh, initiatives and policies uh, within uh, the Southeast region of uh, Europe. Uh, two uh, institutions uh, represents Hungary, KIFU, with the infrastructure part and the University of Debrecen uh, be, with the training and dissemination uh, uh, part of open science. We have a CONOS delegate, uh, this, uh, and Gyöngyi uh, Karácsony, she is the opener nod uh, as well. So uh, in this case, uh, she uh, she is able to establish uh, uh, she is able to uh, start uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, start uh, to and uh, mm, the, she is able to talk uh, with the policymakers and uh, other representatives within the country about open science and how to uh, integrate infrastructures uh, uh, in. Uh, in the Hungarian uh, research uh, life cycle. Um, HRDA was uh, established as well in Hungary. This is the Hungarian Research Data Alliance. We, had a, we have a charter, uh, his name is uh, Andras Hol. Uh, if a Hungarian researcher, policymaker, or any kind of stakeholder interest uh, has an interest in open science uh, across Europe or uh, open science policies within the country, uh, they can use uh, the open science that HU 
platform which has been coordinated by uh, our university. We are members, uh, uh, we are active members in CORE, LIBER, DART Europe, and uh, we are uh, coordinating the Hungarian uh, consortium, uh, Hunar Consortium. This is Hungarian Open Repository Consortium. Um, all of the uh, higher education institutes whom has uh, um, <clears throat> repositories are members of this consortium and uh, we can uh, establish uh, uh, institutional policies uh, and have um, um, we are able to uh, find uh, uh, good solutions to questions uh, from uh, each other's institution. With this uh, consortium we are making uh, uh, training for last year we started uh, uh, training train, training the trainers and uh, this uh, year we start on open science question on uh, the change of uh, the scholarly communication and this year uh, the target audience uh, is uh, mostly P uh, PhD students we are training uh, PhD students uh, on research data management, on uh, all aspects of uh, scholarly communication and how open science uh, could uh, align uh, with their needs. Uh, and we have, um, 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 we are, uh, we, we have to start training uh, our researchers uh, to align with the funders policies on uh, research data management plans. Uh, we are just about to start these trainings. COVID-19 uh, had a big uh, delay on this. We, we were uh, about to start it in March. Thank you for your attention. Please feel free to ask questions. Thanks a lot, Judith. Uh, so now I welcome all, 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 the pan, all our panelists back uh, and uh, we have two questions. So one of them was from Wencott from Digital Curation Center in the UK, our colleague uh, who addressed this issue of uh, trustworthiness of, of repositories. Uh, so I'll read again uh, this question and I'll welcome uh, all panelists to answer it uh, if you'd like. Maybe some of this has already been uh, discussed, but open question, what steps are being taken to ensure repository trustworthiness, especially when scaling towards global levels through cross uh, repository infrastructure and services? Anyone would like to comment from your experiences? Um, maybe a, a clear, a question about clarification. So is trustworthiness um, being defined as technical capacity for the repository or is tr trustworthiness assessment of the, the, the value of the content, quality of the content? So just if you could clarify that, then I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've just made, made one content panelist so if you unmute yourself and can't you should be able to speak clarify that hi everyone thank you um yeah i guess i'm talking about in terms of uh, core trust seal those sort of metrics that are used mm -hmm. essentially but whereas that might be aimed at individual repositories now you're talking about joining up different repositories across borders, etc. And how would you ensure that that trustworthiness is maintained? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges with like, for example, the core trust seal is that it was too, it's too high of a bar for many of the repositories. So actually recently core did a, a, a consultation, we, we looked at all of the different assessment frameworks for repositories. Um, and we did a community consultation with uh, repository managers from different region to create a best practices framework. So that, that really works at the repository level. But I think um, in terms of cross repository exchange or cross network exchange of data, maybe we're not quite 
at the level yet where we, at the maturity level yet, where we have started to think about that. But it's certainly something as we evolve and expand those kind of relationships that we should start thinking about. Thanks. Anyone else would like to answer with a question? Okay, so maybe we can take Bilana's question. Bilana is our colleague from uh, University of Belgrade. Uh, uh, will the UNESCO Open Science recommendations uh, scheduled for the end of 2021 next year will help your regions to boost open science? And what level, policy implementation or something else? Well, uh, I think that's mainly in a political way. I think that the governments are uh, always regarding uh, this kind of actions, uh, this kind of uh, uh, movement. And I think that uh, it's very important to uh, build uh, political legislations, for example, uh, and I don't, I, I'm not sure about implementation because I think that we need to think about the the infrastructures that each country have uh, to build uh, its own uh, infrastructure. Yeah, but I think that's very, very important in a political level. Thanks a lot, Bianca. Any other questions or comments? Uh... No, I was just going to add to Bianca's, you know, to say, yes, I do agree that it's, uh, it will be largely on, um, on the policy level. But when, when, uh, when I look at it from the perspective of the research networks that, you know, we hope that will support this in terms of the infrastructure, they're also connected to that to the mindset of government in terms of their funding. So if, if at this political level, there's, a, there's much more reception of the idea of um, open access, especially as we've articulated it in the, uh, in the Open Science Africa statement, then the governments become more aware that, you know, at a national level, there's some infrastructure required. And because the frameworks of NRENs already exist, then the NRENs are might see more funding for implementation. So uh, on that basis, there might be, there might be additional spin-offs uh, beyond the policy level. Thank you. And when we were drafting those recommendations, we, we had discussions, uh, should we spe specifically say invest in open infrastructures, sir? Because we, we didn't have uh, that kind of wording from the beginning. And then we agreed that uh, it would be important to keep it, to make it really action driven. I see a question from Lara to Judith. Um, and it's an open question to Judith, and I'll also read it to you. You said that you have uh, offered training for PhD students. So my question is, uh, do you have this training for open science policy for national level in this moment? Uh, actually, this is uh, not training for open science policy. It's a uh, training for uh, uh, how to use open science infrastructure how to align with FAIR principles, how to align with the funder policies, uh, and uh, talking about uh, 21st century uh, scholarly communication. What, uh, sorry. Mm, thanks. Is this an answer to the question? For Lara? I guess yes. Uh... So I have uh, one discussion topic that I'd like to put to all of the, the panelists, because <laughs> I, I think one of the real challenges is around um, funding uh, these kind of services. So I think the repositories are more or less okay because they're attached to the institution and they can receive institutional funding. But as we start to create these 
value added services, then we need to develop funding models that'll work to support those services. And so I, I just like to know, you know, especially because we're thinking of non-commercial models and the value of having non-commercial models and thinking about this as, as research infrastructure, how, how are you guys thinking, you people who represent um, national or regional uh, services, how are you thinking about um, finance, you know, financial sustainability um, in the coming years? It's a fantastic question. It's a very good question. I would love uh, to, to have a response for, for that question. But I think that it's very important, the, uh, the work with um, uh, international collaborations uh, and uh, participate uh, to international projects. Because, uh, as I said, uh, we have our budgets, national budgets, and uh, it's very complicated to, to think how to maintain or even to create uh, regional uh, infrastructures or national, sometimes national infrastructures. Uh, and we, th we have to think in the international, about international funds, because uh, some regions have uh, problems <laughs> with funds and uh, collaboration projects in collaboration. Uh, I don't know, I think that it's, mainly uh, it's a, a kind of thing that we have to think together all all words have to think together if you want if we want to create a global infrastructure we have to think in a global funding uh, as well mm, I, it's my position So, so Bianca, Bianca is living the reality and uh, doesn't really know. So I'm wondering, you know, what I can add to this. But in truth, I, I think there is a there is a case to be made for uh, cooperatives uh, if we can get the if we can get. I'm thinking purely from the African point of view, where our requirements might not be as extensive at the moment as some other regions. So if we were to if we're focusing on um, community effort and able to get the buy-in from the, the from the countries then we might be able to leverage technologies that give us gives us shared infrastructure that we can build local services on so that's right now um, because of the state because of the level we are at I cannot define that any clearer but that is um, that is the so the ethos of the rain you know how we've sort of Use the uh, economies of scale and the co community we built around the networking to vastly reduce prices for internet penetration is a sort of model we're also looking at. So if we start to think that you know if if you take the that paradigm with connectivity into the other areas and are able to sort of uh, create similar constructs, then you might be able to share the costs. And then it become, and if you have, if you have, especially if you have government goodwill and the willingness to leverage frameworks that allow them contribute to an outcome, then it is possible that you know at least on a, we can start to build the the steps of the scaffold. Thanks a lot. Does anyone Just else? Uh, to add on this, because there's, there's um, I agree that there's, there's funds, that money that can be can be uh, injected in the in the infrastructure. But my my feeling uh, as a as a librarian and as a, the, the community that is uh, governed by openness values and things like this, uh, I think that we need to invest more. Uh, human time 
in this because usually we're just working for our own institutions for our own local needs and investing times to be part of a national or international structure or infrastructure you need to uh, there's some cultural change in, in, in organization on this. Uh, and for me, there's something similar in what, what we're trying to build with repositories and with, uh, with the open source uh, movement and the way we are, we are using it in, in, inst in institutions. Usually we use it, but we are not giving back what we are, what we are using. So when we try to build infrastructure based on openness and on, on such kind of public goods or, or value like this, I believe that we need to engage not only funds, but also people that are aware of those values and can work, yes, for their institutions, but have time to contribute to a larger scale at the national level or international level to build this kind of infrastructure. If you stay um, glued in your institution only, then you, you can talk about openness and international sharing, but you will stay in your institutions with, uh, and, and I believe that if any people in a library, and let's say in library can, can contribute a, a, an amount of time, of its professional time to give back to this infrastructure, nurture this infrastructure and the, um, be, it, be it technological, be it code being, being contributed or being, uh, just training or other kind of uh, services you can you can share. I believe that's something we can find rather than having only organizations specifically de dedicated to this uh, infrastructure. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm expressing myself clearly here. Yeah, so it, it's but, clear. I think I, I agree okay. with you. And we also have a comment from Pedro Principe from Mini University that he fully agrees with you, Pierre. Okay. So, and, and that's something maybe, I, as, as I put in my presentation, in, in Canada, we are on the verge of, of asking us all those questions about uh, silos and how to, to bypass the institutional level to go national and to go international. And I think it's a debate we will need to have in our country on what, what, how do we engage in such uh, large scale global services. I know there's another question waiting, but just to follow on this, because I think, you know, um, if we look at the amount of money that's going to subscriptions, there's so much money there, there's billions of dollars every year. Um, and some of that money could be transferred over, but that, that that's challenging. But then again, what worries me about that is that it will continue on the inequalities that already exist because there's a lot of money in Europe and North America, which will end up being transferred to the services in Europe and North America. And then there's less money in, in like Eastern Europe and Africa and Latin America. So how can we, as we try to transfer funding towards open science services, as well, how can we make sure that there's more equity in, in the, the way those funds are distributed and, and that we can ensure that the infrastructure in developing countries is, is as good as the infrastructure in, in developed countries? Maybe nobody yeah. has the answer to that. <laughs> oh, well, I think we already have the answer. La, La Referencia is an answer because that's an infrastructure from the global south, which is which is an excellent infrastructure, which uh, we don't really have in Europe or North America. So there are already examples. Uh, and I guess uh, like it, in, in some cases, it would be about uh, budgets and uh, funding. In other cases, it would be about collaborations like Omo mentioned, where non-financial non transactions would happen, where institutions would commit to maintaining certain services. Uh, and to me, that's part of uh, regional discussions or national discussions and solutions. Because mm -hmm. like even what, what happens in Hungary is different from what, what is going on in Germany, because Europe is also diverse. Uh,
Yeah, Natalia is writing transfer knowledge, technical know-how. Well, so it's a question <laughs> from whom to whom <laughs> we'll be transferring. There's one, um, Natalia, there's one question I think at the top from Natalia in, in the question and answer. Mm -hmm. Shall I read it? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Want? Okay. Um, it is well understood that policy is crucial, but is there something specific we can do, perhaps together, to speed up the process? There are so many areas uh, that we can target to achieve small steps. For example, we worked on the guidelines. What else and could we prioritize? I mean, I think from my perspective, um, we have been in a way, launching these activities um, without not, uh, sometimes not with having a, a kind of a global view of the landscape. So I do think we could have further discussions following this panel about how we can continue to work close, more closely on some specific issues together. I think that would be really beneficial. Um, we know that the open air project is ending soon, so it, it may be un under the, the auspices of, of CORE or, or another organization, but I think it's important to continue to try to collaborate. And open air is also a legal entity now, and uh, Eloy Ninger, chair, Open Science Policies Standing Committee, that is also looking uh, into those issues. Uh, I think for me, a big push would be if we could uh, offer robust services on uh, research assessment and evaluation uh, using this distributed network of repositories and offer services to funders. Uh, and um, if we could use the money that I use now to pay uh, all those bibliometric databases that are not really doing what they are supposed to do for us. But I don't know how quickly we can do that. And Gultikin is writing push to funders. Uh, there's a there's a, a note here by Eloy in, in the chat. I'll just read it out because he seems to not be able to write in the Q&A because he's a panelist. Um, there's a big need, but also a big challenges on creating or sustaining community consortial infrastructures at different levels, national, regional, and global. That could also address the less resourced institutions or countries to have access to updated infrastructure and services. If I can speak. Yeah. Okay, sorry, because uh, I could not write on, on the Q&A. No, yes. no, my point is, and I also uh, think uh, Pierre uh, really raised uh, or nailed down the, the issue very well. The question is, I think there is a, 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 a big challenge when we, for instance, on core, when we speak about the, the global knowledge commons, uh, we want to, uh, that commons to be inclusive, but to be inclusive, uh, the, the, the kind of same level of, uh, of technology, infrastructure, and service must be real global. And in some countries or regions, that too is really a challenge because institutions, their repositories, they have no personnel, they have no resources, they have old machines and things like that. And I think uh, the solution for that is really to create a consortial uh, uh, infras uh, that can be, again, uh, with uh, funding from founders, from uh, the money that we, uh, 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 divert from subscriptions, etc., that can help uh, uh, at national, at regional, and even at global level to 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 support uh, 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 to have that kind of safety net that uh, everyone can really participate on these uh, uh, global commons. Otherwise, we will be in trouble. Luckily, for instance, in Portugal, I really think it's we are very fortunate because we have already created uh, 12 years ago that uh, that level of. Uh, of infrastructure with, uh, for instance, with repository hosting services, with journal hosting services that allow each uh, individual institution to have up-to-date uh, 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 access to infrastructure, uh, uh, even those that have that are small or don't have the, the human resources or the machines to, to do it. So 
And I think that's really a model. Of course, it's not the Portuguese model that need to be replicated, but I think we need some kind of, uh, of that uh, solutions uh, to, to address the problem. I completely agree with Eloy and uh, also with uh, Natalia. We need uh, that the, the we need that transfer uh, of the knowledge, uh, the technical knowledge. Uh, we need the sp the spread of this advances of technical knowledge all around the world, all the regions. Uh, and uh, I agree also uh, with good kind. Uh, we need to push the funders. <laughs> it's a reality. And the idea of a consortium uh, sounds to me a good idea, a consortium of founders. Uh, sounds good to me, like uh, an initiative that could be very interesting for our countries, our not so developed countries. Yeah, I think um, maybe what Eloy was referring to was more like a consortia that that use a common infrastructure. But the idea of having a consortia of funders is is interesting as well, um, as long as the funding doesn't get directed, you know, again to the to the north to the global north, which is tends to be what what happens. So how do we achieve that balance? or some greater equity around, around that. But I, I also agree with you, Bianca, in terms of international collaboration helps to, um, to ensure that there is a, a funding distributed beyond just one individual uh, region or, or country. I think there is also a problem that uh, a lot of scholarly communication activities uh, in Africa or in Southeast Asia or even in Europe uh, happen um, in uh, small institutions. And usually they don't have time to, to do what they are supposed to do, plus participate in all these advocacy activities and uh, all the service. So one of the examples is this recent uh, Coalition S uh, survey on diamond open access publishing, uh, publishing that doesn't require authors to pay any APCs. And there were very little responses from uh, Asia and Africa. And I guess one of the reasons was that uh, journal editors and publishers didn't, you know, didn't, didn't see a need, didn't have time to engage in those discussions. But unfortunately, if, if you're not engaged, then your, your voice is not heard. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't re really know how to solve this but, problem. I mean, again, that's that's coming from the global north. So if you don't feel that yeah, that's that, that. relevant to you, because it's something that's happening in the global mm -hmm. north, that's kind of pushing mm -hmm. <laughs> transformational agreements anyway, you know, then I can understand why you might not be engaged. I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, for us from South, uh, it's very important to see uh, the changing of the old science, the structures of the old science. For example, the evaluation systems, uh, the, for example, the impact of factor because we are always, we in the South are always following the model of the North. And so it's very important to us that this kind of structure of the science is clearly changed. Uh, and so it's it become to us uh, 
less uh, difficult to change our realities. Because the rules of the game uh, still are the same, are still the same. And so for us, it's very difficult to say, no, I will not use the factor impact, for example, if the developed words are, use, are still using it. And I think that uh, it's very important to change some, some, some of the, these rules to, to have the impact that we are looking for. Uh, but we are waiting because <laughs> we are always following the developed countries. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that it's, for us, it's, that's the point. That's one of the major points. Um, this new policy that was adopted in China might have an interesting impact, which where they've said now that researchers must publish only five papers, I believe, a year that will be counted for research assessment, and three of them have to be published in local Chinese journals. So um, that will be interesting to see if that has an impact also on on um, West sort of more Western countries in terms of rethinking. Um, it would I help can... though. It it would help though to like uh, have a cultural change. Um, I mean, in scholarly communication, to have like such policies, because uh, we have the same situation. People don't really publish in Diamond uh, Journal because uh, they don't have like uh, the uh, metrics they would like to apply, or their funders. Just as on follow up as uh, to what uh, Kathleen was mentioning about uh, the Chinese policy. Currently, the, the European University Association is discuss, discussing some kind of recommendations for uh, assessment, career assessment. And uh, probably uh, this is still an ongoing discussion, so uh, don't quote me on this, but probably one of the recommendations will be exactly to include just five, and probably we will not have five publications, but just list your five top contributions to, to, to research. And it, they cannot, and eventually they could not be publication, could be a, a, other types of thing. And that will be the assessed no. So we don't want a full list of your papers and uh, the impact factor of the journals that you've published, but you should present to assessment your main research contributions, be it publications or, or, or something else. So stay tuned and hopefully by early 2021, there'll be some recommendations to European universities on, on that. Uh, on that direction. I noticed there's also um, uh, another comment in the chat from, sorry, I didn't catch your full name. Um, so I, and I, I'd be interested in particular in, in Bianca and, and Omo's response to this. I'm gonna mention trust again, but in a different context. From anecdotal experience, I have, heard that there is a lack of trust in places such as Africa, a, a lack of trust in the open access movement. So I think what you're referring to is that uh, researchers are don't trust the open, ac open access journals um, as much as they do in terms of the traditional subscription journals. Hi there, well, can I speak again or? Oh. Yes, go ahead. You well, can clarify I, your, I, your comment. I was talking about open science there, but um, but yeah, open access too, I guess. But um, I'm part of uh, the uh, Schools of Research Data Science, which um, we, we've we held schools in Africa, and, um, Latin America and elsewhere. And one of the things that the students frequently observe is that, um, what do they get out of open science? Coming from low and middle income countries, there is a lack of trust of what 
benefit do they get? And that can be a big obstacle that needs to be overcome, I think, in helping people realize that there are benefits for them as well. Uh, yes, there's all this talk about Global North and Global South, um, but yeah, they, they have justifiable reasons why they do feel sometimes that they shouldn't make their data freely available to others. That they may be scooped, you know, the usual arguments against open science. I mean, I think the researchers in Canada feel are similar, so I don't think it's just a, an issue of, of develop, developing countries, but, but I'd be interested to hear what Omo thinks about that or, or Bianca? I, well, I was going to sort of refer to the fact that it is more about, you know, um, a, a lack of awareness of the benefits. But then, as I'd say, and so that's, so that's the first thing. So it's the, so uh, organizations like we are formed uh, building capacity, part of that whole capacity is also uh, creating frameworks that deepen the understanding um, uh, of these actors. Like you said, uh, like you say, uh, Catherine, I don't think that's, well, that's the good thing. You know, it also refers to, I think it also links with Natalia's uh, comment about exchange of technical know-how. So the first thing we have done is looked at the other environments and we're seeing that this is not peculiar to, uh, peculiar to us. It might be that in our context, there are uh, different uh, issues to contend with when like you know we, we talked about uh, sort of you know the reward scheme and how it favors uh, how the in a northern environment the global north it can be employed to support the researcher to think more kindly of, of uh, about open access what, what I think we need to do or what we are doing is first of all you know increasing the awareness of the benefits and then trying to drive uh, policy support for arrangements that make that even clearer. So if, if you're, for instance, if you're, apart from being scooped, if you're, if you, if you're tied to some situation where publishing in a non-open access uh, uh, journal or what, whatever repository improves your personal circumstances, then open access is not likely to be uh, your go-to uh, sort of approach. But if that were turned around and like the Chinese example that you know uh, you just sort of cited, that became sort of over the overarching understanding of what scholarly communication is, then that would change. So it's, it's, it's about the environment and the awareness of the kind of support the researcher and whoever is publishing it. So it's not, it's less lack of trust and more uh, lack of awareness. There are already examples at the national level, Ethiopia, open access policy, ministry introduced uh, open access to publication requirements. Uh, uh, it also requires data management plans and uh, it said that uh, they are changing the way researchers are assessed. Uh, and uh, they will make sure that uh, open science practices are really rewarded. Sir. So there are also some examples from Africa. And uh, I added a link in a chat to a webinar that we will have uh, on Friday next week with a speaker from China who will talk about uh, the new policy and its implementation. And we'll, we'll also continue on Wednesday next week. We'll talk about uh, community governance in open infrastructures. Sir. So thanks a lot for joining us today and spending these two hours uh, discussing uh, collaborations. Sir. I think we could have continued for another couple of hours. Sir. But, um, Unfortunately, time is up. And uh, Natalia wrote in a comment uh, to Eloy's previous, uh, in, in a question, sorry, to Eloy's previous comment, funding may only come from the region. 
is spent on the region and only two by local organizations. Key question is whether we can build a strong international coalition consortium that we can facilitate uh, that can facilitate this process and strengthen these organizations to receive this funding on similar network. What Oma said, uh, connectivity. This is happening now in Europe's reuse. It's getting a momentum and national countries are starting to fund open science. So any closing remarks from our panelists? And thanks again for joining us in, at the time, which, which is not the most convenient to you. Sorry about that. Just to say thanks, everybody, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you all. And have a nice... Uh, day, afternoon, evening, uh, and uh, join us uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for other activities uh, within uh, Open Air Week. And uh, please make sure there is a separate registration link for every day. So tomorrow we'll talk about uh, collaborations with repositories, journals, uh, create systems uh, with content providers, and source day uh, services for researchers, and um, on Friday services for research community and COVID-19 response. Uh, thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.